Hi, welcome to our channel of Ignu Audio Books, Indira Gandhi National Open University, School of Translation Studies and Training, SOTST. Master of Arts, Translation Studies, Maths, English. First year. MTT 010 Theories of Translation. Block to Ancient and Modern Western Theories of Translation. Unit 6 Ancient Western Theories of Translation 6.0 Objectives After reading this unit you will be Familiar with the West and the beginnings of ancient Western translation Acquainted with the different Western theories of translation from the beginning to the end of the 19th century Be familiar with the ever-changing stream of translators and guidelines regarding translation in West. 6.1 Introduction. In this unit, we will discuss the development of translation from the beginning to the end of 19th century. Since translation emanates from translation shifts, the development of translation theory is largely the result of translation, including translation works done in different periods. 6.2 Theories of Translation and Translation Works It would be useful for you to know that translation work was practiced long before it was realized as a discipline. What we call translation studies refers to the production and variation of translation in translation studies as observed by André Lefebvre, Andé Lelevon, in his zones collected in Translation has come a long way from being a secondary art and routine, a mechanical activity, to scholarly work being considered the main feature and the basis of the new modernity. As Nicolas Barrio put it in his Manifesto of Alter Modernism for the Tate Art Gallery, 2009, artists are looking towards a modernity which will be based on translation. Today there is a need to translate the cultural values of cultural groups and connect them to the global thread. 2009 This also resulted in changes in the role and function of the translator. Now he is an invisible presence, shadow presence, and beyond the roles of man of the year, a bagger at the church door. Due to the centrality that translation has got in the present century, it has become necessary to know that we should know the development of translation. Incidentally, this is primarily a history of translation theory in English Europe as English became the medium of intellectual exchange that enriched itself and used translation as a tool for the acquisition and dissemination of knowledge and information in the colonial and post-colonial periods. In a country like India, which has a history of being a multilingual society even during the period when Sanskrit visions were composed, translation did not develop into the conscious systematic practice it did in the West where the nation-state culture translated the role of literature as a tool of communication will be discussed separately on various Indian thinkers and translators. 6.3 Early Tradition of Translation, Western Perspective The theorization of translation came into force in the 16th century by Etienne Dollet. This unit will discuss the development of translation theory in the West and the guidelines that emerged from translation traditions from the 3rd century to the early 16th century. According to Eric Jagbasson, Translation is a Roman invention. The Greeks, before them, added translation to new fields of knowledge, metaphysics, ethics, aesthetics, politics and poetics, and other disciplines that united physical existence and metaphysics. The Romans mistook the philosophical clarity of the Greeks for the depth and breadth of imagination. Their emphasis on jurisprudence and governance can be seen in Justinian's Institutes. Prominent writers were Elores and Cicero, who discussed translation in their discourses. 
Horace mentions some guidelines for translation in The Art of Poetry. Here Horace advises that translation should be used to enrich the mother tongue. Similarly, Cicero talks about two types of translation while distinguishing between the two advocates. The translation of sense for sense instead of word for word. He says, if I keep word for word, the result will be bad and if there is a change in the order of words or words, if necessary, then I will seem to be different from the work of the translator. Here it is said that the translator has to do both a fine balance has to be maintained. Raman used translation to enrich the mother tongue and literature by introducing new words or borrowings and suggested that translation gives rise to a new dialectical system within a language. Roman Scholars such as Horace caution against the dangers of Antara translation, they advised a logical interpretation of the source language before translation into a competent language. Translators responsive to target language readers or who mostly knew the source language as well. Susan Bassnett has said, the Roman reader was generally able to verify the translation against the original text, in contrast to the monolingual reader's access to language. Through translation, the translated work through the original text. Used to read Pope. Domasus with the gradual decline of the Roman Empire and the spread of Christianity in Europe, the medieval period gave a new direction to the history, theory and practice of translation with the aim of spreading the word of God or the word of God. Domasus began the translation of the Bible and in the 17th century, in 1607, Emperor James I began the work of the canonical text of the Bible, which was completed by scholars in 1611. There is a common stanza in English in Wycliffe's second Bible translation, written between 1595 and 1996. Lesson 15 outlines the four stages of the translation process. 1. An effort to ensure the old Bible collection, commentaries and an authoritative Latin prototext. 2. Comparison of different versions. 3. Reconciliation with old grammarians and ancient goddesses and words and complex meanings and why should be translated as much as possible, as well as translated by collaborators. The first key statement about the stages of translation contains a key fact that is not needed in today's translation. The translators of the Bible had to collate much of the Latin source text in a comparative way. It was then understood by popular grammarians and theologians who considered the source text and the meaning of complex words, focusing on sentences for clear translation meaning. The most important aspect of the translation of the Bible was the collaborative effort of those who could improve it. In this way, this work of translation was a laboratory of cooperation. It also sparked a debate which continues to this day, what should be the unit of translation, word or sentence John Purvey instead of the word sentence. Meaning, they value texts because their purpose is to make the text comprehensible or so, that even an ordinary person can understand the text. Bible translation was given a new direction by the advent of the printing press and William Tyndale, 1494-1536, who translated the Old Testament from Hebrew into English from the New Testament's Gref. Like his predecessors, he also aimed for a version understandable to the common people. The complete Bible appeared in 1488 and the first Greek New Testament was published by Erasmus in 1516. Erasmus' version later became the basis for Martin Luther's version in 1522. Luther noted two important points. 
In his circular letter on translation of 1590, he used Unbesetzen in the sense of translation and Verdotschen in the sense of Germanizing. This means that they used translation as a means of domesticating knowledge and they did not give more importance to grammar than meaning. Grammar was considered necessary for sentence structure etc. In a statement, the focus should be on content and meaning rather than on grammar because grammar should not rule over meaning. Later New Testaments were published in Danish 1529 and 1500, Swedish 1526 to 1541 and Czech 1579 to 1593. Even persecution did not stop the translators from translating the Bible into a Protestant and Catholic version. T.Y. Daleswill was jammed in 1926 and he had to sacrifice his life at the age of 19. Coverdale's Bible, the Great Vivid, and the Geneva Bible appeared in 1535, 1539, and 1560, respectively. These vernacular translations were intended to enable common people to read, sing, and practice the ways of God. Susan Bassnett Bible translations are classified in three ways. One, to correct errors caused by earlier versions due to inadequacy or linguistic inefficiency of the source language. Two, to give a universal and aesthetically pleasing style. Three, the canonical treatise. 1611, prepared by 47 scholars appointed by James I to clarify the points of superstitions and to limit the interpretation of scriptures to the general public was the culmination of this process. It prefaces the as yet unanswered question, is the kingdom of God the word or the syllable? During the period of Bible translation, translation efforts were also going on in different regions. In the medieval period, translation found a place in the new education system to improve speech and writing skills. In the first century AD, Quintilian, in his Institutes Oratorios, outlined two fields of study, the Tivian, grammar, rhetoric and logic, and the Quadvian, arithmetic, geometry, music and musicology, as the basis of philosophical knowledge. Emperor Alfred, who reigned from 871 to 899 in the 9th century, favoured the Latin translation. They were influenced by the Roman translation system and thought of translation as a way to recover from the devastation caused by the Dane invasion, which had destroyed the educational centres of the old monasteries and brought down the empire. He saw the potential for the advancement of knowledge through the English translation of works that could establish literary excellence. Alfred used translation with a view to increase and spread understanding in the emerging vernacular and to construct a cosmic source language. The Rome model of enriching themselves with translation gave a new direction to writers who used their translation skills to raise the standard of their vernacular. Along with this, awareness was seen increasing in the field of translation and related subjects. For example, Roger Bacon, 1214 and 1294, made a distinction between translations from ancient languages into Latin and translations of contemporary works into the vernacular with an Awareness of the problem of loss in into translation. His contemporary Dante, 1265-1321, recognized the importance of translation for increasing outreach and discussed translation in relation to the moral and aesthetic status of the arts and John of Trevisa, 1326-1412. Giant Franco Folna called medieval translation dividing vertical and horizontal translation. The source language was more important in the higher translation, which was classified into categories, e.g., Latin. Horizontal translation between two languages, 
such as Norman French to English or Prequel to. Italian was equally important. 6.4 Translation Theory in the 15th Century A look at European translation activity for 1500 years before the 16th century reveals the fact that translation was a Europe-centred activity. Some translators made some guidelines but they cannot be called principles because principles are the factors of change in the prevailing system, whether it is from literary theory or translation theory. Theories are often successors. Two existing traditions and different theories are incorporated from the traditions. For example, Bharat Muni's Natya Shastra and Nams Kavya Shastra were composed after the practice of Sanskrit drama and poetry, etc. Other art and poetry forms. Similarly, in the West, Aristotle's poem was also written on the basis of classical Greek poetry and drama. Although many knew, Topics were considered along with the translation, but apart from the phases of Wycliffe's translation, other theories did not emerge in this period. The invention of the printing press in the second half of the 15th century brought a new boom in the field of translation. 6.5 16th century It is an interesting fact that Itin Dolit, 1509-1546, a humanist, is considered the originator of the first translation theory. In his short French treatise of 1540, which was translated into English as how to translate from one language to another language by translator, he set forth five principles for a translator. The translator must fully understand the meaning and intent of the original author, although he is free to clarify ambiguities. The translator must have complete knowledge of both the source language and the target language. The translator should avoid literal translation. The translator should use common vernacular language. The translator should choose the words appropriately. Like his predecessors such as John of Tressa, Trovisa, Dolet placed importance on the understanding of the source text. He has emphasized on the complete knowledge of both the source language and the target language. At least for now, the so-called absolute knowledge is a dream. He was aware of the debate about word-for-word -word and sense-for-sense -sense translation. He advised that a translator should give importance to sense rather than word but he has not denied the position of the original word for the same. Yet he has asked to avoid literal translation. In a way, he has asked the translator to adopt the middle path. The fourth and fifth principles deal with understanding with an attempt at translation into the target language, for which they talk about the selection of appropriate words from the common language. His focus on translation with perspective is on the effect of the unity of all the facts of the source language as reflected in the target language. His statement describes translation as something more than a mechanical exercise of linguistic patience and search for cognate words. Dolet influenced his later translators. George Chapman, 1550 to 1634 was one of Dolet's later translators who translated Homer's work into English. He recalled Dolet in his dedication to his book The Seven Books, 598, and he explained the principle of translation in his own words, which also appears in his translation. According to him, it is the work of a skillful and capable Translator that should closely supervise the author's sentences and composition and grammar and understand his original intent and possibilities. Avoid literal translation. Trying to reach the sprint. Overlaws based on synonyms and phrases. Now instead of words, attention is drawn to a more comprehensive unit of words, the sentence, 
but never to anything more than a meaningful association of words. The qualities of a qualified and skillful translator are to look carefully at the form, structure and sentences of expression in the original language and be able to understand the meaning and meaning of the literature written in the source language because all that to be translated into the target language. Apart from this, it gives a new direction to the translation work by considering translation as a virtuous work and combines it with the intensive search of other forms and words which becomes the principles of good translation. However, it can be equated with the correct tone of both or it can be placed under the target language in the definition of ontological existence which is beyond the technique or skill of translation. In that period North, in his 1579 translation of Plutarch, changed Plutarch's indirect method to a method in which he desired speed and accuracy and the language used at the time. The translation of Pedarca's sonnets 1503-43 gave rise to the Petrarchan sonnets in English. Thus, the present scale and format of translation became the reason for the birth of a new method. Philomen Holland, 1522-1652, known as the Great Translator, translated the script into Latin. Translated the script into Dhana. His remark is significant in the sense that he desired that his translation reflect his mind in English to some extent. It was inclined to compromise in terms of expression, but he wished to keep it as true as it was in Latin, as well as at the same time. Instead of using any effect, he followed the meaningful and popular. In a way that a good translator would consider keeping the source to the prescribed subject and using a manner that is neither very complex nor very simple, he ignored charges of obscenity, as he did in the English translation of Pliny. In the midst of these allegations, the translation continued to inform and guide the imagination of the people of that period. As George Stainer pointed out, translation in that period became a means of establishing links between the past and the future and between different languages and traditions that were crumbling under the pressure of nationalism and religious conflict. 6.617th century. The political upheaval in the middle of the 17th century and the restoration of the monarchy. And the return of Charles II, who was living in France, to England, gave rise to neoclassicism, a kind of classicism. The period between 1625 and 1660 was the period of French classicism and drama writing. According to classical principles and standards, was in vogue with the return of act to two. Classical canons and characters adapted to French and English art. The comparison and discussion of form as a whole and the poem in particular was common, and John Dryden, 1631-1700, discussed it in the context of drama in his essay of dramatic poetry. Incidentally, Dryden was one of the main translation theorists of this century, who first classified translations into English in his preface to Ovid's Epistles, 1680, in the following way. Metaphrase, paraphrasing, translation of Cicero's attitude to steam imitation, where the translator may omit the original text as appropriate. Dryden considers the translator as a painter. Just as a painter tries to make his painting look like the original, a translator should try to make the target text look like the source text. A content translator should keep these things in mind and follow the second of the three types of translation mentioned by Dryden. Here we must note two of Dryden's predecessors. Sir John Denham, 1615-1669, expressed the principle of translation clearly in his poem to Sir Richard Fanshawe upon his translation of Pastor Fido, 1648, 
In the preface to his translation of The Destruction of Troy, 1656, he discussed the nature of art and work in form. In the translation of poem he cautioned against the application of the principles of literary translation. According to him, it is not the job of a translator to translate language into language, process into process into poses or poetry into poetry. According to him, the soul is so subtle that if it is transferred from one language to another, it will travel or spread. The translator should capture the spirit or center from the original subject and transfer or recreate it in the desired subject. He said for the first time that the writer and the translator are on the same level. Abraham Cowdley, 1618 1667, a contemporary of Denham's, added a new form of translation that later became known as free thinking translation. He himself accepted himself as a translator and did not hesitate to point out that he had taken a lot of liberties in his translation, which can be used by any translation. In the preface to his Pindrick Odes, 1656, he reported that he had experimented, omitted, and added at will, without being at expense to the way and manner of speaking of the original. Author 6.718th century. A neoclassicist, Alexander Pope, 1688-1744, was a link between the 17th and 18th centuries. He translated Shakespeare by reconstructing the plays in a neoclassical form. He translated classical works in such a way that they can be followed in translation. The neoclassicists emphasized on following the classical authors and their works in a formal way, as a result, considering the translator as a follower. There are ethical elements in this concept. It was considered the moral duty of the translator to be aware of his duty towards the original subject and the intended subject. The notion of a translator being a follower was seen in the case of a theatre artist as a translator. In Life of Pope, 1779-1780, the scholar of English. Literature, S. Johnson, discussed the subject of interpolation, enhancement, of a text by translation, which is intended and thus adds beauty and does nothing in the process, does not get destroyed. Alexander Fraser Tyler authored the first book on translation, Principles of Tramutation. He has given three main principles of translation. 1. The translator must fully capture the point of view of the original work. 2. The style of writing should be similar to the character of the original. 3. Translation should have less literary value. Tyler's emphasis on complete transcription and translation of the text into the target language and the transfer of style, accuracy, and simplicity to the target text was a reaction against Dryden's format of detailed translation. He emphasized the role of the translator in capturing the special spirit of his author, who could speak or express himself. The translation is not an adaptation, but a translation of the source text and its fragments into the target text. Goethe, 1749-1832, observed that every piece of literature passed through the three stages of translation occurs repeatedly in certain episodes. Worn conditions have to be familiar with. Abroad, Goethe had in mind a translation of the German Bible by Martin Luther. The second situation is relocation and adoption of a new. In this situation, the sense of foreign work has to be taken, but a new creation has to be done in the native language. The original features of achieving complete similarity between the subjects in the source language and the target. Language are innovative. The translation of 
Goit, has been kept as an example of this. Period. Here it seems that Goit does not try to understand it in his own terms by the vision of universal profound creations in the concept of his originality. 6. 8th 19th century. A link between the 18th and 190th centuries of translation theory and the German and English. Metaphysical Mischi, who influenced Goethe, his influence on the categorization of the translation phases had an effect on the categorization of the 19th century poetry and the discussion of creativity led to a change in translation and its design. St. Collinge, 1772-1544 Was influenced to a great extent discuss power and imagination, the difference between the mechanical brain in Germany and England to the question of whether translation is a creative act. This brought to the fore the theme of the meaning of the subject behind the subject, which the translator must understand or grasp before it can be translated. Ow, a. W. Schlegel assessed that the acts of speaking acts of translation because the nature of communication is to publish the received information while retaining the form of the original. A reaction came from Fugden Schlettierschars, 1768-1834, in Germany, his theory led to translators in England such as an F. W. New, Himakalail, 1795-1881, and William Morris, 1834-1896, following his theory, Homeri Odipak Aryan and Woman, received because the work of the translator of Odyssey because it was not easily translatable from one language to another but said that in the process of adding innovation to the change, Morris translator from the rites of the ancient language of the 19th century to German and one translator. Approved to translate the translation to idol work, Thomas Carlyle, translation. The episode was given new direction by the American poet H. W. Longfellow, who discussed the issue of not using alliteration in his translation of Dante's Divinia Commedia, Divine Comedy. He pointed out that his book had only one feature which it was exactly what Dante had said and not what he might have imagined or something. In a way, he tried to make a literary translation of his translation like a real translation. He accepted that some grant could be given for the translation of Dante, a great poet. Loyalty and truth are more valuable to him than fame as he compared Taya to a flower on a sari. He further explained, the function of a translator is to convey what the author does, not to convey what he means is the function of the writer. What a writer says and how he says it, it is a translator's problem. The translator has a limited role as a narrator. Fight Grilled, 1809-1863, best known for his translation of the Rubaiyats of Omar Khayyam. 1858, took a different position from his contemporaries such as Amild and Longfellow. He pointed out that one must live a subject at any cost. One cannot keep the moon well, with one's life being transferred to a worse one. He expressed this in a metaphorical way. He pointed out that a living dog is better than a dead lion. This suggests that it was possible to carry the culture's version of the source text into the target text. While he translated freely, as claimed to correct the shortcomings of the Rubaiyats, he did so as a representative of the colonial masters in the source text. His approach to translation consists of taking one of the best or sifting out something, and he adds a dimension of ideals or politics to translation. Theory and Studies 6.9 Let us sum up. Thus, the process of translation theory passes through different periods from the early 
centuries till the end of the 19th century. Its main currents can be seen in brief by classification as under translation as an act of the scholar was considered to be more effective than any translation into the target language of source text. Translation is a means that encourages the scholarly reader to return to the origins of the source language. Translation as a means that helps to make the target language similar to content the better reader of the original, which is done by introducing target language. Translation as a means by which every translator who considers himself as the transcreator Venutis frees the true language reader to make his own useful choice tries to elevate the subject because the above discussion helps us to understand the development of translation theory and translation to understand the development of translation work in the 20th century leads to the century where an unprecedented interest was found towards translation theory and translation works. It was only in the second half of the 20th century that translation studies became established as an independent academic discipline. Thank you for watching. We will see you in the 